All right, everybody, welcome to NorCal Sports Network, and we have a special treat for you tonight. We've got Giants legend Dave Dravecki joining us. Dave, welcome, Dave, from Colorado Springs, right? You're still in Colorado Springs? No, actually, we are now in um, Mesa, Arizona, Dan. Oh, you're in Mesa. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we've, oh, we've moved all over the place. So Okay, I'm... I'm I'm on the other side of you. I'm in Sun City area of uh, Arizona. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Sun City West, right in Pure, right outside the, uh, sub, you know, the city limits of uh, Peoria. We're actually in the Peoria School District, but I've got the Sun City West tag on me, so I feel like I'm. I got a. I got a disclaimer. I got a. I'm not that old where I'm totally retired in, in, a, in a retirement community yet. <laughs> That's, Even though I qualify, yeah. <laughs> same here. I actually, uh, I've actually f frequented Sun City uh, because I just uh, about eight months ago had a knee, partial knee replacement on my left knee. And, okay. Um, the orthopedic surgeon that was highly recommended was in the Sun City area. So. Oh, okay. Maybe I'll get you get his name after the show from you because I've got a I need a hip replaced, and I've been talking to different orthopedics, and most of the ones that do knees do the hips too. So, yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, what a, what a it's special awesome. treat to, you know, a lot of, uh, old time giants fans, uh, are part of our show. And, um, you know, I remember the trade that brought you here in 1987, along with Kevin Mitchell and Craig Lefferts. Uh, sure. that was, that was a blockbuster deal. I think it was a seven player deal. Yeah, well, and um, you know, I mean, both teams benefited. I mean, the Padres got Mark Davis, and and they got Chris Brown, and they got um, Keith Comstock. Yeah, Keith Comstock, and and Mudcat Mark Grant. Yeah, yeah, Mark Grant. Yeah, who's now broadcaster with the Padres. So yeah. it was a it was one of those win win trades. I thought, but I thought the Giants did get the best of it. Still, I mean, we got great years out of Mitchell, and we had fantastic year out of you in 87 and yeah. 88 and uh so tell us what was uh what was it like that was the only time you were traded i believe right um you came up well, i originally signed with pittsburgh okay okay so i was traded in the minor leagues from pittsburgh to san diego and then um fourth of july was traded over to the uh san francisco giants in 1987 that yeah. was that was really hard dan um you know, you are in an organization, you basically come through the minor leagues mm -hmm. in the Padres organization. And, you know, and I, I, I loved it there. My family loved it there. Uh, we were building relationships in the community. And that was a, just a wonderful place for us to be raising our kids at the time and, and, um, and, and building that community of friends. And so when the trade came, it was really hard. You know, and, and uh, you know, obviously the Giants were a rival. And, right. you know, and, and yet when you, I look back on it and I think about it now, um, you know, it's really interesting that within the Western Division, we were traded. That's so rare. Yeah. yeah. So rare. Uh, so initially, initially my wife and I were like, oh my gosh, we're going to San Francisco? <laughs> and, you know, we just, we didn't know what to expect. We knew the city was beautiful, but we didn't know anything about the surrounding area. Um, all we knew was the can was Candlestick Park and the Weston St. Francis in Union Square. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's all we remembered from traveling into the city to play the Giants. And so um, at first it was, it was really hard when that happened, but it went away really quick when we Gosh. actually landed in Chicago and we got into the clubhouse uh, of the Giants, and we were greeted by Mike Kruko. And, you know, and Kruk said, man, welcome, guys. This is huge for us, and we're really looking forward to it. And uh, uh, so that was the initial contact with a player. And so now you've got someone saying, hey, you're a key part of this organization now, and this trade was huge for us as we marched towards the pennant. And... And then we got uh, one of the kids in the clubhouse said, hey, uh, the manager wants you up in his office. And so Kevin and Lefty and I, we ended up 
walking upstairs to this tiny little office that was stuck up there in the visitor's locker room of, in, in Chicago. And and uh, Roger Craig, Al Rosen, and Norm Sherry, all three were actually in the office. And they had a sit down in front of them and basically said, gentlemen, welcome. And uh, you are key pieces to the puzzle that is going to take us to the promised land. And wow. they, made one, they made, you know, if you remember that year, there was one additional trade um, that ended up I think they ended up getting Donnie Robinson and yeah. they picked up Rick Russell. Rick Russell. <laughs> yeah. You know, so they so they got Big Daddy and Donnie Robinson. I mean, Big Daddy came in. Um, you know, you looked at Big Daddy and you go, <laughs> what's he do? <laughs> and, and that, I mean, he was a stud. This guy yeah. the nastiest sinker he could hit, and he was like a cat on the mound defensively. Yeah, big guy, but he could move. Yeah. He was very athletic. And Donnie Robinson, he could have been in a regular lineup as a DH. Oh, yeah. That guy could <laughs> hit. Flat out hit. And, you know, yeah. and had, obviously, you know, as a relief pitcher, he had great stuff, too. He was a I, really good pitcher. I have a baseball right here from yeah. May 15th, 1980. I was in the stands and I caught this ball uh, at Candlestick from. Willie McCovey was the batter, and Don Robinson was pitching for the Pirates. No way. Yeah, I got it. I got the score right there. Pirates three. Yeah. Uh, Giants two in uh, twelve innings, and Very I, cool. I put, it, put it on there that uh, you know Willie Willie yeah. really turned it that way. Yeah, Willie McCovey, Don Robinson. So that's really it, cool. It's kind of a special ball because two two. Ex Giants, you know, later on and stuff. But yep. uh, Willie, Willie was my my favorite player growing up. Willie McCovey. Uh, but uh, so eighty seven comes. You guys end up making a. Uh, I still remember the series. I think it was. Let's see, was it August or? Yeah, it was August. It was early August. You guys were playing Cincinnati at home a four game series and you were down like four or five games to the reds it was a key series and you swept them and it just took you guys just took off you were like 53 and 55 going into the series and you ended up the year 90 and 72 wow. or something like that so but then you get into the playoffs and back then it was you know east versus west yep so just one one round to go to the World Series, and it's two two, I believe. And you're pitching Game Six in St. Louis, right? Was it two two at the time or three? No, you guys were up three two. We you were up three two, three two, because you won. I was at the two games at Candlestick. You won, mm -hmm. and so you went up three two. Hacksaw, Hackman Leonard was going crazy, hitting home runs left and right in the series. You're pitching game six. Yes. It's a pitcher's duel, zero to zero. Take us to that game. And I, we all who watch the game remember the misfortune of Candy losing the ball in the lights. But yeah, tell us what was happening in that game. You were in a groove. Yeah. I mean, coming off a of game two and throwing a two hit shutout against John Tudor. Yeah. I'm feeling really good. And so you go into game six and you know, um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm cruising. I mean, things are just following what happened in game two. And so, you know, everything is going extremely well. I'm firing on all cylinders. I'm hitting spots. I'm changing speeds. I'm, I'm getting a really good lineup out. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, we run into uh, the situation with, the ball hit being being hit in the lights and and I can't I have to be honest with you Dan I'm not I am the worst when it comes to remembering things in my career <laughs> I just know I had a lot of fun as a pitcher for the Giants and the Padres but I do know I do know that when Candy went after the ball I mean you could tell that it was right in the lights Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, he was making every effort to make that catch. I think it ends up that the guy gets a triple 
out of it. Yeah. Is, is it Quinones? I'm I think, trying to remember you know, um, uh, who it was at the time. I, I think that's it. But uh, anyway, they're standing on third base. And the next guy up hits a pop-up to right field. And it's in foul territory, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And Candy comes up and makes a great play on it. But they get the run. The runner tags and they right. score. Okay, so now we're down one to nothing. And, you know, I, I went six innings in that game. Yeah. And we ended up ultimately losing that game one to nothing. One, one to nothing, yeah. And Atley Hammaker, you know, my best friend in baseball and and uh, still one of my closest friends to this day. Oh, that's cool. Didn't yeah. know that. That's great. He went in game seven. He got to start game seven. I think we ended up losing that game maybe four to two. If I'm not mistaken, something like that. Yeah. Something yeah. That, but, uh, you know, just a tough, tough series. St. Louis was a really good ball club. George Hendricks at first. Right. You, you got Coleman, you know, in the outfield. You got Willie McGee in the outfield. You got, I mean, Lonnie Smith. These guys run like deer. You know, I yeah. Mean, yeah. That was a fast team. Ozzy Smith, like you mentioned. Yep. Still, Tommy Herr. Ozzie, um, Tommy Herr. Yep. Yeah. Fell at third base. Um, I can't remember who did they have behind the dish. Uh, was that um, oh, what was his name? Oh, uh, behind the the plate. Yeah, behind the um, plate. Oh, was it was it Daryl Porter or who was? His? It was Daryl Porter. Okay, Daryl Porter, Porter. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so anyway, they had a great ball club, you know. So going up against them was really tough, and losing that series was really hard. Um, because, you know, we felt like we were the better team. Yeah. You know, it's it a difference whether you feel like you're the better team or not, Dan. On yeah. Any night, the best teams get beat, and sometimes by a team that is considered the worst. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, we had yeah. were, we were going up against one of the best. Well, Here's we a, two teams standing. Right. Here's a question from one of our listeners and, and uh, longtime listeners. Mark Gray says, uh, at the time on that foul ball, did you want Candy to let it drop, or or did you feel like he had a shot at him at the plate? Oh, no, man. I thought he had a shot him at, uh, of him at the plate. Um, you know, we got to get outs. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, that's the bottom line. You know, I, I, I have to say something about uh, Candy because uh, I really – I've got a really good relationship with Candy. We were in Mexico a couple of years ago on the Giants Vacation Club uh -huh. uh, trip, and it's really cool. We were with I don't know how many fans. It was just really awesome. And uh, Kipe was on the trip, and Chris Spire was on the trip, and Robbie Thompson, Candy Maldonado, myself, and I think um, uh, uh, one other person was on the trip, on that trip. Uh, and so anyway, as we were being um, – we were in a panel of discussion with the fans one night after dinner. And so they were having the opportunity to ask us questions. And, you know, somebody asked about the incident in right field. And I just said, Candy, let me answer that. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I want you all to know something. Candy Maldonado um, was doing everything he could out there to catch that ball. And, there's no question that that ball was in the lights and it was just unfortunate that happened that happened, but I would want candy Maldonado in right field every night for me because yeah. that's what I think about candy Maldonado as a baseball player. And, and I've got to tell you, Dan, um, I think for years he had held in whatever mm. it was, you know, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the judgment of whether or not he could have caught the ball, mm. just an excuse, all that for all those years. And he came up to me afterwards. He gave me a big old hug and said, wow. thank you so much. Yeah. Um, you know, we're all out there trying to do our best. Right, right. And at the end of the day, you got a pop up you can catch. You're not thinking about dropping the ball. You got to right. make a play and then you come up firing to home. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it was just unfortunate, but at the end of the day, you got to score runs to win, right? 
Right. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's that's and that's, uh, you know, we don't want to get too much. I don't want to get too much into the current giant situation, but that's the problem with uh, the current ball club. They having a trouble scoring. Well, I don't know if you got a chance to see that game a couple of weeks ago with Blake Snell and Chris Sale. That was a old time classic pitchers duel. No, I didn't get a chance to see it, but yeah. um, I did see the box score of today's game because I missed. I didn't get yeah. a chance to watch it. Two for fourteen with runners in scoring. Yeah, position. final hit came in the in the bottom of the ninth. Yeah, yep. seven guys left on base. You can't do that, and it's right. been pretty consistent throughout the season. You yeah. Know? Well, we went through this last night on our post game show. One of the biggest. Uh, reasons the Giants have trouble scoring is because they have too much swing and miss throughout the lineup. We looked at every player on the team in the lineup and every starter has a higher than 20% K rate. And then we looked at the Dodgers, the Diamondbacks and the Padres, most of them in the teens or low teens. And that's why, you know, you see guys not being able to hit with runners in scoring position because you, you can't have unproductive outs. You, you, you got to just make contact. Yeah. Yep. You know. Move the line as, as yeah. the old guys used to say, you know, put it in play, see what happens, move the line. Yeah, you know? yeah. absolutely. Eventually happen. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because you played with um, Tony Gwynn. Was he there with you in San Diego or was he not there yet? Yeah. We came up to the big leagues together. Okay. okay. So you were with maybe I consider one of the top five greatest hitters you know, just with being, I mean, the guy never, never struck out. And, but today's hitters, I don't get it. It's like Tony would, you know, okay, I got two strikes. I'm going to change my approach and just, you know, I'm going to hit the ball somewhere. I mean, Greg Maddox shared a story, him and Smoltz and Glavin, I think <laughs> yeah. combined struck him out like 10 times in his whole career, in their whole careers, something crazy like that. But, yeah. So you playing with Tony, and then you see what happens today. Guys just swinging for the fences, and the, and I mean Tony would be turning over in his grave right now if he's watching today's game. Well, I've had the I, I just got back from San Francisco where I spent the weekend and had some time with Will Clark. Um, mm. I mean, when you when you bring when you bring the veteran player into the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's there's a there's a significant frustration in us in relationship to the way the game's being played today. Um, you know, the analytics, I mean, the small ball that we used to play, get the runner over, hit behind the runner, you know, advance the runner, get him in scoring position, you know, move him over to third with one out, hit a sack fly, you know, or get yourself a base hit, but make sure you put the ball in the outfield. Right. You know? And so, you know, at the end of the day, there were just those little things that we did in playing the game. And, and I still think that people are interested in that way of baseball. You know, we've, we've gone through such a, oh, yeah. you know, we've gone through such a transition in the game. I mean, uh, uh, Dan, I've got 28 complete games in my career. Yeah. That's more than probably the entire big leagues has this year. I bet. Yeah. And, and Blake Snell just threw his first complete game in his career. Right in his career, the other, you know, when he threw the note. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, when you, when you think about that, you just shake your head and you ask yourself, why, what, what is the difference? And, you know, that's a great, great question. We've asked that. Do you have any answers to that? What, why it is that way? Yeah. Because I think, I think, um, the, the analytics is driving, from my perspective, maximum effort on every pitch. And mm. they want velo. They want spin rate. And I find it amazing that oftentimes you'll hear, man, the spin rate's up, but he's three feet out, out of the strike zone. Right. What good is spin rate if you can't throw for a strike? Right. So, you know, the, the other thing that's frustrating for me personally is that when you when you promote, and I won't put the blame on ma Major League Baseball altogether because college baseball um, has adopted some of that. 
you know, you get these kids down in high school that want to go to D1 schools and everything's about maximum velocity. Right. It's about maximum effort. They want to see the velo. If you don't hit a certain number, you will not even be looked at right. out of high school. I mean, that to me makes no sense. Not at all. When you consider Greg Maddox never threw much harder than what, 94, 95? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and he, part of his career, Dan, in the early part of his career, when I was playing for the Padres and we would go into Chicago and he was starting, we could not wait for the game to start and face him. Yeah, because he threw straight. Yeah. And then somebody got a hold of him. Yeah. And taught him the art of pitching. Yeah. You know, today I'm, 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 I'm so curious, you know, I, I had a, I've had brief conversations with pitching coaches mm -hmm. and I've said, man, why is it so hard for these guys to take a couple miles off of a 97 mile an hour fastball, especially when you can sink it the way you sink it. Right. So you throw 97, then you come in 94. I mean, that difference alone makes a huge difference and an advantage, yeah. you know, and, and people have already established and said pitchers in today's game have the advantage because hitters are not adapting to the velocity. Well, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's true at all. Sure, there may be an edge because of analytics with pitching. Mm hmm but in the game of baseball, when it comes to hitting, what are we being taught when we hit? You know, we're finally starting to move away from launch angle. Right. Um, everything is about exit velocity. Yeah. So how hard are you trying to swing? I mean, Tony Gwynn didn't care about his exit velocity. You know, <laughs> times he lob and volley, uh, volley off of the, over the shortstop's head like he was playing tennis. Yeah. And the dude yeah. was a magician with that bat in his hand. It was his magic wand. Yeah, right. You know, he so was unbelievable. Yeah. Just, I mean, I, I had, we'd looked at his stats, his career um, on here one night and we were pulling it up and we were just like amazed at the, uh, the strikeout numbers and then just the hits for average. It was, it was unbelievable. Uh, I think one year he struck out like, I want to say nine times or something the whole year. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was he was amazing, Dan. He he was he was one of those rare guys. He was like Barry Bonds, yeah, uh, once, once in a generation player. Um, you know, a Nolan Ryan. You know, today, you know, unfortunately, the injuries with Mike Trout, but another one, right? That's one of those generational guys. Otani's a generational guy. You know, Mookie Betts. I mean, here's a guy that I love watching. And you know why? Because he's a little guy. And, man, the dude hits for average, but he can also hit a home run. And you know what? He doesn't. I don't think he thinks about hitting home runs. I think he thinks right. about hitting line drives in the alleys. That's part of the problem. Yeah, it you know? really is. It really is. I, I was actually – I've actually uh, got it right here. Look at Tony Gwynn's year. He hit 394. He had uh, 19 strikeouts in uh, the at bat. Yeah, in in 419 at bats. It was another year, 679 in 1989. 679 plate appearances, 30 strikeouts, hit 336. The year yeah. you were got traded, uh, 370 in 87. Yeah. Or 35. I mean, the guy just, he struck out 790 times in his, in over 10,200 plate appearances and less, it's just unbelievable. And guys today are ob obtaining that strikeout rate or those numbers in three seasons. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's, it's, it really is amazing, but I will say, you know, getting back to the, 1987 playoffs against the Cardinals, yes. man, I'll tell you what, it was such a joy to play on that team with those guys to be traded over. You know, um, when, when Al Rosen, when we first met Al Rosen, Roger Craig, Norm Sherry, and they said, boys, welcome. We, you are part of the pieces of the puzzle that is going to take us to the promised land. 
man, we we all of a sudden realized as we started playing with this ball club just how good these guys were. And yeah. we, we were a part of a winning environment. And yeah. I'm convinced, I'm convinced, Dan, that it was then that this Giants thing started rolling. You yeah. had Willie Mazes, you had Willie McCoveys, you had, you know, you had your greats from the past that everybody thought about. But all of a sudden now it's postseason run. 87, you know, we miss going to the World Series. 89, we get to the World Series. Right. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, you had, you know, things starting to happen in the organization and Barry Bonds comes in. Right. The- that was the key. Was Roger Craig and Al Rose, and I'm convinced, they had the attitude, hey, stop complaining about candlestick and the cold. We're going to use it to our advantage. And, the, and, and Roger Craig, what was it like playing for such a – positive manager like that oh it was great because he let you play mm. you no know, he let you play and he did things unconventional he was the guy that always you would think in this situation you got a bunt no not with him you know and then yeah. all of a sudden out of nowhere comes a bunt or and a you're squeeze like, suicide yeah. squeeze <laughs> but this is cool you know so he did things very uh, he was really unique and and I really liked him. He was just a good man, just a good guy. And and I really enjoyed playing for him. Um, I loved Norm Sherry. Norm mm-hmm. Sherry was my pitching coach in San Diego. Wow. And so when I came over to San Francisco, he knew me. Yeah. And what I loved about Norm was when I would go to the mound and I was having a rough time, he would come out. And there would be just a few things he would say to me. Um, Every now and then he'd say, look, slow it down. Mm. And I knew exactly what that meant. I I just would start rushing in my delivery. So he actually, through slowing it down, forced me to focus on being more deliberate in my delivery. And that kept me in balance to then explode to the plate. the other thing he would say when he would come to the mound is put your hand behind your ear. Get the arm up behind the ear. Get your hand behind the ear. Get it up mm-hmm. there. And I, you can't get your hand behind the ear. It's almost impossible when you're throwing yeah. a baseball. But he knew by saying that to me that my arm slot would no longer be, I'm trying to make this work, be to the side, uh-huh. but all of a sudden I'd be on top and it was not just the arm mm-hmm. on top. It was the, it was the fingers on top of the ball instead of on the side of the ball. And he knew just by getting me to do, just by getting me to do this, uh-huh. get it up, get it up here. Um, behind wow. the ear was behind the ear was the phrase that said, do that. Wow. Wow. So I would make the adjustment. So it was, it was an incredible year. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was it was uh, it was a fantastic season, and it led to, like you said, I mean, a whole new era. Giants were from seventy one was the last division title until eighty seven. So yeah. I was ten years old in um, seventy one. So I went through my entire teen years with no playoffs, not winning baseball, seventies. Uh, <laughs> 80s, we got teased a little bit in the 82 season down to the last weekend of the season. But yeah. then, you know, the 85 season was horrible. They got lost 100 games, and then they drafted um, Will Clark and, and Robbie Thompson. And, you know, and that was the beginning. And then they brought in Roger Craig, and it it just changed everything. And then with the, you mentioned Al Rosen. So what, what I want to talk to you next about, Dave, is, is you come out that 87 87- season and you come back in 88 and 1988 you um you were uh let's see what, what am i looking here i was just looking at your your numbers here 88 two no two and two yeah yeah i was two, two and two. two you didn't you didn't uh you only threw 37 innings uh that year you were yep. dealing was was it was the shoulder acting up then yes. um and, yep. but you but you didn't when did you find out that you had uh cancer and then had to have the deltoid uh muscle 
you know, taken out? When, when was that? I think it was in September of 1988. So, okay. so you know, when I started the season, Roger gave me the ball on maybe opening day. Right. Um, so I'm slotted in the number one position. I mean, incredible honor. Right. Opening day, you know, Dodger Stadium, you know, uh, Fernando Valenzuela versus Dave Dravecki. Yeah. You know, he painted a better picture. We went on to win that game five to one. I threw a four hit. I threw, gave up four hits and I hit a double off of Fernando. So, you know, I mean, there was a lot going on in that game. Right. And I was more, I was more excited about the double than I was about the pitching. Funny you, cause uh, we had Sean Estes on a little over a week ago and he, he said his biggest thrill, he, he pitched uh, in a game where he had, he was given the sign to hit Mike Piazza back when he was with the Mets and, uh, but because Clemens had, uh, or not hit Mike Piazza, but hit Roger Clemens. Excuse me, he was given the sign to hit hit uh, Clemens, and and he missed him in, in the first inning. Missed him, and it created a brouhaha, and then settled down. But later in the game, he hit a home run off Clemens. And he said that was the real thrill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah. So, so you opening day, you pitched tremendously, and. A little bit later, not too far along after that, not too much time passes, you start feeling something. What was what was going on? And and uh, tell us about how everything came about, how you found out, and yeah, what was going on. Well, uh, I was I was dealing with um, an impingement in my shoulder, and I couldn't figure out what was going on because I, I tried to throw hard and I couldn't get anything on the ball, mm. and. And I kept telling Norm, Norm, there's something wrong. You know, I can't get anything on the ball. So they basically um, put me on the disabled list. And 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 I don't know how long I was on, but then I tried to come back, went on a rehab assignment down to uh, Phoenix. And I was in the bullpen and I said, Norm, it's still bothering me. I mean, this mm. there's there's something going on. So I went back and um, Dr. Campbell, um, he went in and did surgery on my shoulder. And lo and behold, I had a frayed bicep tendon. And so what was happening was the, the, the fraying of the tendon was getting impinged every time I threw a pitch. Mm -hmm. So there was just pressure on it every time I threw right. And, and it was just really irritating. And it just restricted me from being able to throw. So they went in and they cleaned that up. Um, but but then I, I continued to struggle. And and I did, did, things just weren't going well. And as a result of that, we were getting close to the end of the season. And they just shut me down because I wasn't able to come back. And, and then when they shut me down, this lump that had developed on the outside of my left arm had started to grow. Part of the reason why we didn't move forward to do anything, which was understandable, was because my arm was in a state of atrophy because mm -hmm. I wasn't using it. And because I had had the issues, I wasn't able to build strength back up. So uh, we kept an eye on it. And then in September, uh, Dr. Campbell said, you know what, Dave, I really want you to have this checked and get another, get another MRI. Mm. So I went and I got an MRI at the Cleveland clinic. And, and um, I remember sitting in the examining room. I don't know if we did the MRI in uh, San Francisco. And then I went to Cleveland and I got a call from Dr. Campbell. You need to go see the doctors in Cleveland. We've got some concerns on what we see. Um, so wow. in any, in any case, while I was in Cleveland, at the clinic, they did a biopsy. And my wife and I were waiting for the report from the biopsy um, wow. in the examining room. And it was a really intense time, Dan. Really yeah. intense. Because, you know, we were under the impression that it was a hematoma where mm. muscle fiber had torn. Right. All the muscle fiber calcified. And it was hard. It was a hardened mass. So would this mass restrict me from pitching? What would we do to take care of it? And that was what we were thinking in the process of waiting for the doctors. And when the doctors came back, they had confirmed 
what what had ended up happening was the door was opened a few inches. We were inside the examining room. The doctors were outside. They were looking at the films and mm -hmm. then reviewing the report on the biopsy. And outside the door, used the word tumor. Mm. We heard that. You know, the first thing that I could think of we, was we need to pray. And mm. so in that moment, um, I just said, you know, God, I have no idea what we're about to face. But whatever it is, give us the strength to endure. That's all yeah. I asked. And the doctors came in. They told us that, in fact, it was cancer. And he looked at me and said, outside of a miracle, you'll never pitch again. Wow. And in that moment, I, I wasn't thinking about whether or not I'd pitch again. I was wondering whether or not I was going to die from this disease called cancer. Mm. And I did. I was thinking about, you know, who's going to marry my wife? Uh, who's going to end up being the father of my children? And will he love them as much as I do? Mm. And in that moment, though, Dan, the thing that startled me in that thought process was all of a sudden, the thought came to my mind, oh, my gosh, will this guy love my wife and children more than I do? Wow. Because I know who I am and I know I haven't been the best husband and I haven't been the best dad. And, you know, sometimes the game has that effect on us. You know, right. it, everything becomes about us. It's all about Dave. You know, mm. it's the athlete who has the spotlight on him. But what most people don't realize is there's a family in the shadows of Dave. And oftentimes the unsung hero in the family is actually the wife. And in this case, my wife, Jan. Yes. And the role in taking care of our family, taking care of our home. You know, now I'm the one that's going to have to go through the cancer. She's going to now become a nurse too. Mm. And take care of me. And so in that moment, God put a lot into perspective for us, you know, an awful lot. And, you know, I came back to reality in the middle of all of that. And I heard Jan say, could you say that one more time, Doc? And he said, outside of a miracle, he'll never pitch again. And all we hope is that he'll be able to play catch in the backyard with his son. Wow. That was it. Wow. And so in that moment, I had, I had a choice. I had two choices actually staring me in the face. Okay, do I take care of this and just walk away from the game? Or do I take care of this and see where it goes? Mm. And so I chose the second choice. Let's take care of this. Let's get, get my health back. And then let's see if I can move forward with the potential of trying to make a comeback. And a lot of people have questioned why I did that. And oftentimes what I say is simply this. I didn't want to live for the rest of my life because I chose not to try and come back mm. wondering if I could come back. Mm. I wanted to, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that says, you know what? I'm not going to give up until it's very apparent that I can't go any further. Right. And so you know, I've got to try and, and, and I've got to leave it all out there. And if it doesn't work, then I know I've given it my best shot. I mean, my father, yeah. you know, my dad always taught me growing up, Dave, whatever you choose to do, and I don't care what it is, whatever you choose to do, work as hard as you can to be the best you can. Yeah. And then, and then he told me, and then he said, have fun doing it. That's great. That's great advice. And so in, in 88, you uh, you're diagnosed uh, with this and you're now have to have surgery on the uh, uh, to what remove the deltoid muscle. Was it, it was a, it was oh. called a desmoid tumor, I guess is what it was, right? Yeah. It was a desmoid with centers of fibrosarcoma, which is a very aggressive cancer, but because it was encapsulated in the desmoid, it didn't become metastatic and spread through the bloodstream. All which, right. which is really what, what made the scenario the best possible scenario. Right. So they went in and moved the mass in 50% of the deltoid muscle. Right. And then, and then we did cryosurgery, which was the freezing of that. Of the humerus bone? The humerus bone. Yeah. Okay. So, and so no that, 
Yeah. Nobody knew it. You know, nobody had ever done this before. I was the guinea pig. Wow. So then you you make this. Um, you you must have worked out probably harder than you ever did in your lifetime. I imagine to get that yep. uh, strength back and and develop that muscle that was half taken out. Yeah. And you uh, make this amazing comeback. I remember. Weren't you pitching in Stockton? Was that your last game before you made it up? That was my first game. First game. Okay, Stockton. Game. Yep. And then you pitch great there. There's a big crowd there. And then August 10th, you're I'm I'm at the time I'm living down in uh, Southern California. So it's August 10th, 1989. You're facing Cincinnati. Um uh, I just remember the uh the crowd uh just being electric that day and yep. i was uh yeah. i definitely was listening to the game i'm trying to remember and i was just following it and i was just so i mean it was just i remember actually getting tears and brought to my eyes as as uh I'm just thinking about it now i'm kind of an emotional guy but i was just like so so excited for you and you're just um the crowd just went nuts and it was describe that feeling that day. I think you went eight innings. If I recall in that game, yeah, that and, would, that would never happen today. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they would have had you out of there in the fourth, uh, uh, but you go eight innings and you get the win. I yeah. think, didn't you only, I know it was four to three, but didn't you only give up one or two runs yourself or throwing a one hitter through right. seven innings? That's what it was. Yes. Through seven innings, and then I gave up. I gave up the three runs. It was a three-run home run. I gave up to Luis Quinones. Okay. And I, I got lazy with the cutter over the middle of the plate. And I was trying to jam jam him on the inside part of the plate, and unfortunately, he got the barrel on it and hit a home run. But I finished out the inning, and right. uh, then Steve Bedrosian came in and closed the door. Wow. So, yeah, it was it was it was surreal. It was incredibly um uh i i don't even know how to describe it to be perfectly honest with you because um it was just an amazing uh, moment and experience for me i think a lot of it revolved around um how many people were involved in me getting back to the mound i think mm -hmm. that's what i was most overwhelmed with um the love and support of my family wow um, the love and support of Bob Lurie and Connie Lurie and the Giants organization all the way from the top to the bottom and my teammates, um, the love and support of the team of doctors that cared for me to get me back to that place, the love and support of the nurses that had to put up with me when I was in the hospital during that time. Um, yeah. I mean, there were just so many people to thank. Larry Brown, therapist at Palo Alto Sports Clinic, that is was instrumental through my time with him to get me strong enough to be able to pitch again. I mean, that was yeah. all him and his team at the Palo Alto Sports Clinic. And then Mark Laton, who literally stepped in when I was at the ballpark and cared for me and took care of me. And so... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're just standing on the mound, and, and those are the things that kind of flush over you. And, and and the most important thing for me was I saw this as God giving me another opportunity, you know, another chance yeah. for a little boy to see his dream come true by getting back on the mound for a second time. And so yeah. I was so thankful that he brought all these amazing people into my life that helped me to get to that place. So it was a really special day. It was an incredible celebration afterwards. But, you know, we're in a pennant race. So here we go. Right. Let's go, boys. Right. Strap them on and, and let's rock and roll. Yeah. And then, um, of course, you have uh, that incredible game. And then five days later, August 15th, you're up in Montreal. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we've all who know your story, we know it's described, it's it's called the pitch heard round the world. Uh, tell us what you were feeling uh, 
right up to that point beforehand. Yeah. And then the pitch, the moment you threw the pitch, I mean, your, your world literally changed in one minute, like any of our lives could change in one minute. Yeah. Uh, tell us that feeling, how you're, you're, you're pitching, you're feeling good games going along and then boom. Yeah, it was, it was, um, it was amazing. I mean, I was feeling great and I was, you know, firing it on all cylinders again, you know, yeah. and, and through five innings, I, I, I've shut out the, yeah, the expos. And then all of a sudden sixth inning rolls around in the, in, in the fifth inning, I was sitting on the bench and, you know, I was feeling a little twinge, but at the end of the day, it was not even close to some of the stuff that I felt, you mm -hmm. know, prior to going through all this. So I was like, okay, this is normal. I mean, and pitchers are always doing the gyrations and right. you know, touching stuff and moving stuff around. And so it was basically like that. So I get out there on, in the sixth inning and I start struggling a little bit, but I'm still in the zone. And, you know, I hit Galarraga and, you know, it was just one of those things, you know, pitch got away. But then Tim Raines comes to the plate and, you know, TK gives me the sign for the sinker away. And I wind up, and when I go to release that pitch, it was like somebody had shot off a gun right in my left ear. Mm. And it was this huge explosion. And, I mean, I just, at the in that moment, I just grabbed my arm as I was falling to the ground. Yeah. And, you know, because in that moment, I thought, oh, my gosh, did my arm just break and protrude out of the skin? And, and if it did... <laughs> I don't want to see blood because yeah. I'll pass out. I mean, I'm literally thinking about this as I'm almost in shock. And I'm thinking, go, oh, hold it, hold it. And I'm and I'm laying on the ground and Will comes to me and he's, Dave, breathe, breathe, Dave, through the nose, out the mouth. Then Mark Laton comes in, breathe, Dave, breathe. And I mean, you're, we're probably talking, I don't know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds from the time I fell, maybe a minute. And I'm holding my breath. And all of a sudden, I started breathing. I started feeling a little bit better. Um, the arm, the bone did not protrude through the skin. So that was cool. Yeah. And now they're, you know, they're wheeling me off. And and uh, and, and I'm like, okay. So five hours before that, Dan, I was having lunch with Bob Nepper. And Bob Nepper looked at me and he said, Dave, I hate to burst your bubble. But he said, I want you to hear something. I don't think that this experience you're going through is about the miracle of the comeback. I think it's about the miracle of salvation that occurred in your life in Amarillo, Texas. Mm. When you professed faith in Jesus Christ and you put your trust in him. And I think what God's doing through baseball is providing a platform for you to share his love with those who hurt. Wow. And I looked at Bob and I said, whoa. I said, well, you know, Bob, that's that's really cool. But I got a game to pitch tonight. <laughs> you know, I'm back in the saddle, bro. <laughs> I said, thank you so much for sharing that. Five hours later, I'm laying on the ground, Dan. And who, whose words do you think I hear? <laughs> Bob Nepper. Bob Nepper. Yeah. Laying on the ground and all I could hear were Bob Nepper's words. When I was coming out of the shock and I started breathing, all I could hear was, Dave, it's the miracle of salvation. It's the day you met Jesus and God's given you a platform through baseball to share his love, that love through Jesus with those who hurt. And I'm thinking, man, God is up to something so much bigger than baseball. Wow. Those were my thoughts. It wasn't yeah. why me? Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm my career's over, you know, all that stuff. And I'm not I'm not here to say that it would be wrong to feel that way. Right. At all. It just so happened and then in that, that moment there were other things that had gone on that are were now front and center in my life. And and I at, at the time I tried to be positive and saying, well, I'll just have to try another comeback. 
you know, but in the back of my mind, I knew that when I broke my arm, that there was something going on in there that was, was very serious. And as a result of that, eventually I would have to retire from the game. And, you know, so in November of that year, you know, after, you know, being in the world series and, you know, wearing a sling and, and struggling physically, um, and didn't you break it, break it again during the celebration at the, out, like an idiot, I went out and wanted to celebrate again. So, you know, I got the arm broke two inches above the original break. And, uh, and so I was like, my gosh, Dave, you know, what are you going to wise up? And so, uh, it, it got to the point during that 10 day period where they, you know, didn't have the world series. Right. But the Earth, so yeah. hard. It got so hard. I was I was sleeping in a lazy boy chair. Mm. So um, Jan called Al Rosen and asked Al if it'd be okay if we went back to Ohio, which is where we had moved to. Right. And he, yeah, go home, go home and get rest, and we'll connect with you after the World Series. So you know, uh, went home and realized around Thanksgiving that it wasn't going to happen, and I announced my retirement. And yeah, the cancer came back again. Wow. Um, uh, radiation therapy, more surgeries, a staph infection that lasted for 10 months. And finally, the doctors on June 6th, I think it was, or June 7th, I went into New, I went to New York City at Sloan Kettering uh, Memorial Cancer Research Center. And Dr. Brennan, my doc there, he was the chief of surgery, uh, said, you know what, Dave, it's, it's time to amputate. And I looked at him and I said, good. I said, let's just, it's time to get rid of this. Because for eight mm -hmm. months, I couldn't use it. it right. Hang right. on the body. Now, you were, you were born in Youngstown. Do you know Eddie DiBartolo as well? Yeah. The Depart the Bar I sure do. As okay. fact, you know what, Dan? One of the coolest things, when I was a junior in college at Youngstown State University, I had a great year. And I was 7-1 and one with a 0 0.88 earn run average. Uh -huh. And Eddie Jr. called me to his office. And he said, hey, Dave, I wanted, I wanted to just talk to you about your career. He said, man, I'm so excited for you. It looks like things are going really well. He said, I want you to know that I am here. If you need anything, you just let me know and I will help you. Wow. And man, I was just so grateful. Uh, you know. Yeah, he's taking care of a, a lot yeah. of guys. Yes, yeah. he has. He's a yeah. good man. He's a yes. really good man. Yeah. The Niners were very fortunate to have him own that club for all yes. those years. But uh, so you have the arm amputated. And I, I remember reading your book and um, what you went through. A lot of like, who am I? Who am I? Because your identity was your arm. Yep. And, and, and now you've got to deal with these emotions and – it affected your your relationship with Jan. It affected everything. And you had to actually, I think, I'm sure you had to get some counseling and all of that stuff and because you were dealing with anger because all of a sudden your life is completely, you know, you relied on that arm. It, like you, I, I've heard you say your arm, it was like, it was like a fingers to a, you know, a piano player, uh, or the or the feet of a ballerina, right, right, and that was everything to you. Yep. And now you <clears throat> you're questioning who you are. Tell us about that. How did you work through that and eventually, you know, become what you are today? A, a, a you know a, a motivational speaker and uh, helping many other people through hardships in life. Yeah, well, I can tell you that. Um, that it was an extremely difficult period of time. I did go through an identity crisis. Um, and, and a big piece of that was um, the fact that I, my life and, and my identity was so wrapped up in my arm. And I never really believed that it was. But it, it's not until you lose something mm. that you realize just how much it meant to you. And, and so for me, um, uh, it was, it was coming to grips with the reality that I'm no longer going to be a baseball player. 
So if Dave is no longer going to be a baseball player, then who is he? Mm. And, and it was a very difficult time. And in the, in that, in that part of our life during that season, um, we had some really good people help us to realize that in, in, no, let me, let me say that differently. We had some really good people help me to realize that I needed to get help. And, and more importantly, Jan was going through the struggles too, and that I needed to be supportive in getting her help. Mm. And so the both of us entered into counseling. But here's the unique thing. In the beginning, I was stubborn. I was denying that I needed help. But I said, because I love my wife, I'm going to go with her to support her. Three weeks into that, which was right around the time I lost my arm, mm -hmm. right after I lost my arm, I ended up being the guy on the couch. And now I was the one pouring out my guts and learning how to communicate all this stuff that I had stuffed for years in the context of my identity. And now I'm, I'm letting it out and I'm learning how to actually talk about fear, how to talk about um, the concerns I have over my future, all of that. And, and it was absolutely an incredible experience. We were in counseling for 18 months. Mm. On top of that, the counselors, um, uh, through our doctor, our family doctor, um, put us on medication. And we both got on Prozac during mm -hmm. that time. Um, it was extremely important. Uh, it helped in a significant way to restore the chemical imbalances in relationship to what we were experiencing. And, and it was really through the excessive, I mean, the burnout of trying to be everything to everybody during that time right. and having to deal with the identity crisis on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. And Jan trying to take care of everything and holding it together. And it was just way too much. And it just overwhelmed us to the point where we were driven to that place of being unhealthy. And through the 18 months of counseling and getting on the, the antidepressant, we started to heal. Mm. And, and then all of a sudden, we got released from the counseling. We made a decision to move away from Ohio, which was where we were both born and raised, by the mm. way, to get a fresh start. We got to Colorado and Jan, Jan looked at me and she goes, you know, I want you to know, I just got a book in the mail, a manuscript from an author who lives locally, who is a Christian counselor. And the title of the book is something related to um, uh, men and their anger. Oh, is it Patrick Morley's book? No, no, it was not, Gary, not the man. Gary Oliver. Oh, okay. Gary Oliver, Christian counselor out of Colorado at the time. Um, and, and so all of a sudden she says, hey, would you be interested in going to him to work on your anger issues? By this time after the counseling, I was so prepared, Dan, to do whatever it took to mm. not be that guy to be free from all of that. Yeah. So I went in for the next 12 months, I went into counseling. So you take that 30 month period of time and I'll kind of put a little bow on this. You take that 30 month period of time and what it did in the context of my struggle with my identity was to actually help remind me because they were Christian counselors. They reminded me of who I am. Hmm and helped me to see for the first time in my life that what I do doesn't, I, is not my identity. My identity is in who I am. Right. And I had to go all the way back to the day that I met Jesus in Amarillo, Texas, reading the Bible and the Bible literally challenging me. As I read God's word, I was convicted of my sin and went to him in, in seeking forgiveness and acknowledging that I believe, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. I believe that Jesus went to the cross and died for my sins. I believed that three days later he rose from the dead 
and now sits at the right hand of the Father. I believed all of that that yeah. established my new identity as a child of God. Right. And the, what I learned in that, what I learned in that, by going back, I was reminded once again that Jesus went to the cross to take care of my sins. So all my sin got nailed to the cross. And what did he do in return as it, as it relates to nailing my sin to the cross? He gives me a brand new start, a brand new nature. And I get to start fresh. And the scriptures teach that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, that it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. Correct. In, the New Living, in the New Living Translation, the 10th verse says this, For we are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which he God prepared in advance for us to do. Right. I went back to that experience all those years later or early, all those years before when I met Jesus and that's where my real identity was solidified. Yeah. And over that period of time, I had allowed baseball and my arm to in essence, in some ways, Take the place of Jesus. Right. Being where my true identity lies as his child. Right. And, and so so that that 30 months, that was the beginning of a new journey. Right. That was the so, beginning. That was the beginning. Yeah. Where we are at today. And that process of God working on my heart and maturing me in my faith has continued from those experiences in counseling to present day over the last, I don't know how many years since then. Right. And well, you probably helped countless numbers of people who have gone through similar difficulties in life, whether it be physical or emotional, uh, spiritual, all kinds of things. And, and, and that's an amazing story. I, um, you know, it, you, you think about the, the things that we think are the most tragic and, and, things that we can't even imagine getting through. It's really God's grace. Oh. That your arm was was God's grace in your life to what yeah. he to to bring about a whole new uh focus and 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 what he wants to accomplish in you, through you. And uh that's just a remarkable story because uh I know you know, I mean, I, I tell people on this show, we're all going to go through life moments. We're all, it, it there's no, uh, you know, yeah. nobody's immune to it. And no. uh, we all have our adversity. Yeah. So this is, this is tremendous. Tell us, tell us before in closing, as we uh, finish up here, what it's like in a clubhouse when you have several believers, Christians that are on a team, uh, I mean, I've been in sports all my life, and I I know that when there is that bond with many people, it can it can really uh, ignite a team and bring a team together if there is a lot of believers on the on a team. Tell us how how that has worked for you in the clubhouse, and and as you maybe mentor some of the younger players today. Yeah, you know, I I think in our situation. Um, we knew who we were, um, but we were also a part of a much larger group of players. So the most important thing in that clubhouse was we tried really hard not to isolate ourselves. You know, we're they're about, regardless of where you're at spiritually, you're my teammate. You right. know, so the beauty of me as a believer is that I get to treat my teammate in the same way that God treats me which means I get to love that guy the way God loves me. And so Atlee Hammaker, Scotty Gerelts, Brett Butler, yeah. myself, Greg Litton, um, there were a few other guys, I'm sure. Um, what, we, what we tried to do was we tried as best we could, and we weren't perfect in the process. You know, I mean, if you remember back then, we were labeled God Squad 2. Yeah. You know? um, and, and I think uh, 
one of the things we tried really hard to do was to treat our teammates with respect, um, love them well as our teammates, uh, enjoy them between the lines. When we went, we, we had fun together playing baseball. But I think the other thing that was really important for us, because all of us, I think all of us, except for maybe one or two were married, was mm. that we, we actually made a pact with one another that we would, we would protect each other when we were on the road. We would protect mm. each other from any kind of influence that would want to um, do any kind of damage to our marriage, you know, because it... <laughs> The temptations, I imagine, were all there. Crazy, all there. Yeah, they're all there. They're they're no different for us than they are for anyone else. Right. And so, what we understood was, if we're going to enjoy this experience and do it well, and and be good teammates, then we've got to protect each other. And that's one of the things that I loved about my time in San Diego and my time in San Francisco was because I had other people, other players that were believers. Um, that understood the value of protecting one another. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. We got a comment there from Red L. Says, praise God, Dave. Yes, that is uh, a tremendous, you know, uh, I mean, it, I can't imagine what it would be like. And I'm sure maybe some teams it's like this, but I, I, I can't imagine it being too too much. But we're, you're the the only one that is a, a believer and, and there's, and, and you're, you're getting, you know, ridiculed or razzed by the in clubhouse or, you know, I, it, it seems like it would be a little tough, but uh, it seems like baseball and, and, and all the sports really football, basketball, there's, there's a, a band of brothers. Um, and, and I think even what I pick up in, in watching things is, there's a respect, even from the people who do not have the same faith, that they respect you for uh, for for who you are, and and they, uh, you know, I've been around guys, and they'll have a bad mouth, or oh, sorry, you know, didn't mean, you know, so it's, it's okay, yeah. man, you know, don't worry yeah. about it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I used to, you know, baseball chapel played a big part in my life. Um, there was baseball chapel in the minor leagues and baseball chapel in the major leagues. And um, the, the national organization of baseball chapel is in every clubhouse in baseball. So you, you, you do have probably um, a good, you know, four to 5% of the team is, you know, our, our guys that participate in the chapel. Now you have, um, you know, some clubs like St. Louis would get 21 guys that would wow. be that would be in chapel back when, you know, right before Adam Wainwright uh, retired because yes. Adam was a strong believer and, and a strong leader in the clubhouse. Yeah. But guys like him and Matty, you know, uh, Matt Carpenter and, and uh, Matt Holiday and, you know, uh, a bunch of those guys, they were, they were strong, you know, they were very strong. Um, so you had that influence on every team, which, which is actually wonderful, you know, because, um, you know, like I said, you know, you, you need to be careful and staying together, protecting one another is so important. So that was, that was absolutely imperative for us, you know, um, but yeah, it's been, it's been an amazing journey, Dan, it really yeah. has, been. you know, for 30 years, my wife and I, um, we have a ministry called Endurance with uh, Jan and Dave Trevecki and, and uh, our website's endurance.org. And, and endurance.org, okay. Basically what we've been doing for 30 years is, is to your point, in, the, in this journey that we've been on, we've learned so much and so many have given to us that we said, and I remember my wife saying this, when, I get, when we get to the other side, we want to give back. And wow. so our lives have been about giving back. And so we basically will send uh, what we call our encouragement gift box to families who are going through um, some, you know, real difficult times uh, with depression or physical affliction. And most of it's cancer and amputation. Um, but we send out about 1,200 
uh, boxes a year to families all over the country. And in that box is our story to encourage them um, as a gift in a book. And then we also did a Bible with Johnny Erickson Tata called the Encouragement Bible. And we stick that in every box to encourage them uh, with God's word and helping them to understand where God is when it hurts. Mm. That's just a really huge thing for us. And um, we're just so grateful that all these years we've had the opportunity to be able to serve others in that way, which has been really cool. And that's uh, endurance.org, you said, right? Yes, endurance.org. Okay, let me, uh, hope I did my spelling right. Put it, is that it right there? Did I spell it right? You did. Okay, yep. guys, if you uh, want to visit that site and uh, check that out, what uh, Dave and Jan Dravecki have going, you could check out that site. And uh, is there, um, is that places that you can go there? Is there places to uh, contribute there too, as far as yeah. uh, donate? There's, and there's a donate button, but um, as it relates to the encouragement gift box, because that's really where we're, 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 we feel so fortunate to be able to share our story. And we've been doing, I mean, to think that we've been doing it for 30 years is amazing to think that I, I mean, Dan, I've been traveling the country telling the same story for 30 years. Wow. Now, obviously, there's been some adaptation to it because of where I'm at today and all that I've learned. Um, uh, but, you know, you can go to the website and on that website, um, the, it'll, there'll be something that'll be to the effect free gift, free encouragement gift, something along that along those lines. You just click on there. It takes you to a page. And if you know of someone who's hurting, all you have to do is fill that out as to who they are with the information that's there. Or if you are, fill out your information. And mm. and uh, Connie, our assistant, and I think we have four or five volunteers now, um, they will put those boxes together and get them out to you. Wow, that's great. That That is, that is wonderful. And is that uh, run right here through... Is that in Ohio or here in Arizona? That's being oh, it's actually in Salina, Kansas. Oh, in Kansas. Okay, okay, very good. Um, all right. Our assistant Connie, um, we were all in Colorado Springs together. Okay, that, that's where we really got the ministry kind of fired up. Neat. And okay. when, when we moved, Connie stayed in Colorado, but then she moved to be closer to her family in Kansas and her grandkids. So we just moved our ministry with her there. And we now do satellite work. Okay. Me. Well, that's great. Where where can uh, people, if they want to read your books uh, that you've got out, there's come back. And then when there is no, when, uh, you, back. when, you, when you can't come back. And then I know you, you and Jan have written a yep, uh, man together. Where can uh, Amazon, where else? You could go to, you go to Amazon or you could go to our website. We have books on our website that you can purchase. Right okay. There. Right there at endurance.org. Right at the endurance.org. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If yeah. anybody wants to go out and uh, get get one of those books and read more about Dave's story, and um, you know, maybe uh, you're going through a hard time yourself, and um, you know, Dave can uh, can they reach out to you if they want to talk to you about uh, you know through the website? Is there if they just want to yes. get some kind of help in any way? Uh, there's an email. There's there's an email at the website that they can get to. They can they can actually use that email. It goes directly to Connie, and then Connie um, sends it directly to me. That's fantastic. That's, yep. So that's I get those, and I and I get a lot of them. And it's is your speaking tour on on the website? Imagine as well. Yes, I think we do have it posted. There's a calendar uh, that uh, lets people know where I'm at, just in case I'm in their area. Okay, great. Yeah, and if if uh, yeah, if you want to check that schedule out, and if it's somewhere near you, or you check out Dave, he's a fantastic speaker. I've I've been it's been close to thirty years. I imagine. Let's see, nineteen early nineties. So yeah, uh, oh, three thirty. Yeah, about thirty years ago, I heard you speak in uh, Colorado Springs. I was up that way, and so um, that was fantastic. And uh, I, I can only imagine how much uh, things have, you know, in 30 years, how much you've learned and grown. Oh, 
in, in, in just a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. Dan. Yeah. I've learned a lot too, man. So it's been, it's been really good. It really has been. Yeah. Well, we'd love to have you on more. Maybe we can get you back on another time and we'll talk maybe, you know, a little baseball and uh, uh, just, uh, I know you've, like you said, you're an ambassador for the giants and, and that's yeah. great. So you're, you're, you're working with the San Francisco Giants, um, and uh, you know we 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 do the Giants show here on a regular basis. Uh, we're probably um, some people like us to what we have to say, and some don't. We're not. We don't hold back. Yeah, we're, we're, we're not. Uh, I've been a longtime fan for fifty six years, fifty five years since I was. I'm sixty three, and I started following baseball heavily. And when I was seven years old, I can remember nineteen sixty eight Bobby Bonds first game against the Dodgers he hit a grand slam and I was watching it as a seven-year-old and I was you know I had two older brothers and we were hooked you know we were we were we were Giants fans uh do or die and you know we've gone through the rough years so uh we had some glorious years in the 2010 decade and uh I'm not liking what things are going right now so i i want change and so i'm a little bit passionate when yeah. it comes to uh coming out with the giants i want to see them go back to you know their winning ways it became yeah. a, you and me both yeah it's yeah a lot more fun at the ballpark that way that's yes sure. absolutely yeah well dave it's it's been a real treat having you here we want to thank you for for joining us i'll uh catch you in the green room here when we finish here but just uh guys uh if you miss the full show and you're just joining go back to the beginning rewatch it you're gonna hear a lot of great stories of uh the, just talking baseball even talking you know pitching hitting talking about tony gwynn there's a lot in there in the beginning and uh so go back watch it this is one of our best uh interviews we, uh definitely Seven fifty-three. We're gonna do a little post game at eight thirty. We'll do a little Giants talk uh, eight thirty tonight. So if you're here, come back at eight thirty, and we'll we'll uh, cover today's game and uh, talk about a little bit more about uh, the Giants and the direction they're headed and that they need to go. So thanks everybody again. Thank you, Dave. You got it, bud. All right. Good night, everybody. See you back at eight thirty, everybody. <laughs>